My castaway this week is a poet. Born in the West Indian community of Handsworth near Birmingham in the late 50s, his childhood was rough. Approved school, detention centre, borstal and prison were the principal educational influences in his life. It wasn't until he joined the protest movements of London that his talent for performance poetry came to public attention. He had a book published. He was noticed by Nelson Mandela, who later asked him to take on projects in South Africa, and he now travels the world, writing writing and performing. His book of poetry for children, Talking Turkeys, was a bestseller, and in 1989 he was nominated for the Oxford Professor of Poetry. I'd like to be counted, he says, as one of the people who popularised poetry again. He is Benjamin Zephaniah. But it's a particular kind of poetry, isn't it, Benjamin? Not the sort you can sit and mutter to yourself up the corner. I mean, it's got to be performed. It's got to be given everything. Yes, um... We always advise people when they read it to read it aloud, to read it to each other, um, especially the children's work. Um, it becomes a lot more, f- lot much more fun. And I always thought of poetry as something to communicate to people, not as something that I wanted to put into books. In fact, putting poetry into books was the last thing on my agenda. When I published my first book, I couldn't read and write, so I wanted to reach people like myself. So it really is performance poetry. Now, within performance poetry, there are different schools, if you like. Um, there's, you know, there's rap poetry and there's dub poetry and there's all these other forms of poetry, but it is poetry written mainly for performance. And is yours rap or dub or both? It's called dub poetry, and, and I hesitate because, you know, a lot of us dub poets now, we're getting a little bit weary of the title dub poet because, you know, we do something with a bit of a jazz flavour and people go, hey, that's not a dub poem. Um, but what's the definition of a dub poem, then? Well, the word dub comes from reggae. And um, just going back in time a bit, when reggae was being created in Jamaica, um, most of the producers couldn't afford to record a B-side. So they would record the A-side with the singer and, and the normal reggae song. And on the B-side, they would have what was called a dub version. The vocals taken out of it, the kind of drum and bass part of it, mixed a lot heavier, and lots of echo and sound effects on it. And then you may have a, um, someone speaking over it. And sometimes these people, what, what they would do would be called toasting. It was a kind of fast form of Jamaican rap. But then you had people like myself who would do this spoken poetry over this kind of ambient dub music. And then we would also perform it without music. And you know, this is how you can tell a true dub poet. If you listen to them without music, you should still be able to hear the music. Still hear the music yes. in there. Do you want to give us an example? Can, can you give us, read us a short one of yours? Um, yeah, this is a a poem where I um, politically correct the um, English language from a black point of view, and it's called White Comedy. I was white mailed by a white witch with white magic and white lies, branded a white sheep. I slaved as a white smith near a white spot where I suffered white water fever. White listed as a white leg, I was in the white book as a master of the white arts. It was like white death. People call me White Jack. Others call me White Wog. So I joined the White Watch, trained as a white guard, lived off the white economy. I was caught and beaten by the white shirts and condemned to a white mass. Don't worry, I will be writing to the Black House. (laughs) So it's always humorous as well, your poetry, isn't it? Well, usually. Well, you know, it's true that, yes, it, it is humorous, but it's also political and it can be deadly serious. You know, sometimes I realise that you can reach a lot of people through humour. You can tell them something very serious through being humorous. Right, well, we're going to send you away from all of these people. Cast you away on a desert island. You've got eight records. Tell me about the first one. Well, the first uh, record I've picked is uh, Fire Fire on Babylon um, by Sinead O'Connor. I could have picked any Sinead O'Connor record, really. I could have picked the one that me and her did together. But um, I just think she's a real gem and... She's just a woman with integrity. She's someone who I really respect for not allowing the um, business to corrupt her.
Sinead O'Connor singing Fire on Babylon from the album Universal Mother. You mentioned, Benjamin, that you could hardly read or write when your first book was published. You were about 22 then. How did you write it then? You dictated it to somebody, did you? Well, first of all, I wrote it the way it, it, it sounded to me, phonetically. But then when I gave it to someone else to look at, I also kind of made sure that they didn't just translate it to standard English. You know, I always knew what I wanted to say, so I didn't have a, that problem at all. It was just mm. a physical thing of, you know. What really frightened me was listening to a, a, a watching a programme on television that said Benjamin Zephaniah, Britain's new black writer. And it was the first time I'd ever been called a writer. I'd always been called a poet or a rapper or something like this up until then. <laughs> and that frightened me. And I went off to um, kind of night classes in, in, the, in the borough of Newham. And, um, and it was... At first, it was a little embarrassing because people would say, I just saw you on television, <laughs> you know, and you sit next to me in this class. You apparently gave your first performance in church when you were 10. Was that reading one of your own verses or what was it? What were you doing? Well, actually, it was just a case of um, my mother... It was my mother's turn to read, I think. And she'd never had anything prepared and she just asked me to... Well, she didn't ask me, she just dragged me up and said, my son's going to read something for you knowing that, you know, I was a bit of a mouthful. And um, I just got up, and I, I, I didn't know what to do. All my poems were about the overthrow of the government and things like this. What, when you were ten? <laughs> yeah, even then, yes. <laughs> and um, I just read the books of the Bible. I had a real great memory for biblical things. I was one of these kids, if you said, like, you know, Matthew chapter 5, I could go, judge not that you're not beautiful judge, for with that judgment shall be, you know, and just spout it off. So you weren't reading it, really? You, you no, no, I just stood in front of the audience and I went, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and I just went through the books of the Bible and everybody just went, my gosh, we have a prophet amongst us. <laughs> and it was strange because for the next uh, couple of months they really thought I was something special and I was trying to tell them that I, I wasn't. That and, you just learnt it like a poem. Yeah, well, I made it worse for myself because then I had a dream one day that a hand came from the sky and was picking people up from the high street and I went and told my pastor and, and they were convinced that they had, you know, this prophet in them. Which... But did you think you were going to go into the church or did you always know you weren't going to do anything of the kind? I would have liked to. I would have liked to have been able to dedicate myself to something like that that I believed in so much, but I didn't believe in it so much. And, in fact, in the end, you, you turned to crime and got into a tremendous amount of trouble as a, as a young yes, kid, didn't not you? not because I believed in crime. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that p your poetry saved you from a life of crime? Would you go as far as to say that? I'm, I'm not sure. No, I think what really saved me from a life of crime is... And it's going to sound like a bit of a cliché now. I mean, a lot of people say this and it's probably been overused, but I had this energy and... I just found a, a way of channeling it. it. It was as simple as that. You know, one teacher said to me, um, you are going to end up um, doing a life sentence or you're just going to be a, you know, a little car mechanic. And you know, I can see why they kind of thought that. Um, it was strange because deep down in my mind I knew I wanted to do something with words and be a poet, you know, but I was just in that climate where you know, young black kids just didn't say that. Tell me about your second record. My second record, Little Ukulele, George Formby. And, yeah, I just, I just loved the comedy in it, and I loved, I loved that kind of northern humour. I have one of these old sports cars that I take out just on good weather days, and I took the top off, and I remember driving around East Ham blasting this out and all the police looking at me in complete confusion, you know. Why is he not listening to Public Enemy or something like that? Don't you be a scout, why don't you read a book? But I get much more pleasure when I'm playing on me you. Of course I take no notice, you can tell. For mother's sound advice will always stand. She said, my boy, do what I say, and you'll never go astray if you keep your ukulele in your hand. <laughs> keep your ukulele in your hand. George Formby and his little ukulele from his uh, live wartime recordings collection, Formby at War. So, Benjamin Zephaniah, tell me about your beginnings. Handsworth in the 1950s, your parents had come over from the Caribbean. You were the eldest of nine children 
and you lived in terrible poverty? Yes. Um, I mean, I must say, I didn't see many rich people. I mean, it was all poverty. I mean, even for you know the white people around me, we lived in those houses with toilets at the back of the yard and. I don't want to go on about people leaving their doors open, but that's exactly what people used to do. And I remember kind of playing in communal yards, having baths together in tin baths, you know. And just, we did it because we were poor, but there was something really nice about it, something that bonded the community together. Mm. Yeah. But you, your father beat you, didn't he? He was violent towards you. Well, he beat me, and I, I can remember, obviously, some of the beatings... Uh, my mother tells me that he it was it was a lot worse than I remember, but most of all, I remember him beating her. And um, you know, he passed away not too long ago, and it's a real bit of a sore point in my family at the moment because my mother ran away from him with me, leaving kind of eight other children with him. So when he passed away, the other children saw him as a kind of hero, a lone man who raised all these children on his own. And all my memories of him was having this kind of, almost like a kind of wanted poster in my mind, a fixed picture of him. This is the face I've got to avoid. I, I suppose, really, then, it's, it was inevitable that you were going to, you know, go off the rails, bunk off school and turn, turn to crime, really, wasn't it? You just... There wasn't a lot of hope for you, was it? I hated authority. And like many young kids, I kind of... I wanted to keep up with, um, you know, the kids around me. Uh, I did bow a lot to peer pressure, especially in the teenage years. My poetry, I always describe it as like being gay. I didn't tell anybody. It was something that I kind of kept to myself. OK, they, didn't, they knew I was doing a bit of rap and a bit of toasting, things like musical thing, but I, I, I didn't use the word poet. You know, I remember coming across somebody once who actually admitted to writing poetry and we kind of got together and I said, you know, well, you, know you show me yours and I'll show you mine. <laughs> you know, it, was like, <laughs> it was a real secret that we had, you know. So that's when you went into all these approved schools and borstals and detention centres and so on, that was how you amused yourself a lot of the time, was it? Writing, writing in your head or writing... It was in... mainly writing in my head. Um, what I did, in my, especially in my, my last prison sentences, was... I did a lot of thinking, and it was then that I think um, I got kind of political. I started to realise that um, I wasn't really being a, a rebel by going out and stealing something. In fact, I was um, playing into the hands of the law. You know, a police officer stopped me once in Birmingham, and he said to me, um, I remember you. I, remember, I used to kick you. I'd love to do it now, but I can't, can I? because you will write a poem about it and you'll be on television <laughs> and you'll earn more money from me beating you up. And he realised he was in a situation where he couldn't touch me unless he had a good reason to. Record number three. Yes, uh, record number three is Leonard Cohen and it's last year's men. It's um, When I first heard this poem, I should call it, I was just amazed by it and I went to all my friends and said, have you ever heard of this guy called Leonard Cohen? And they said, yeah, it's music to commit suicide to, you know. Um, I just thought it was just so poetic. In a way, he used all these Rastafarian references, Babylon and, 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 and um, the Jews' harp and all these things. He's really, for me, it's, 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 it's important because his words are so crucial and the music just hangs on the words. The rain falls down on last year's man That's a Jew's harp on the table That's a crayon in his hand And the corners of the blueprint are ruined since they rolled Leonard Cohen singing Last Year's Man from the album Songs of Love and Hate. You were 18, Benjamin, when you came out of prison for the last time and you became a rapper in clubs, impersonating Mick Jagger and Bob Marley. And people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I should correct you, actually. It's not, I was a toaster, which is like the Jamaican form of rap. It's rap, but it's to a different beat. Mm. 
there was one one night in in Birmingham in Handsworth when I was in a blues party, this party that we used to have in houses. The sound system was playing, and it um, it was in. The, I think there were power cuts happening then, and uh, power cuts happened, and I had a stake in the. In the, in the takings, you see, so I didn't want anybody to go. So I said, well, look, you know, stay a while and I'll entertain you. And they're what? You know, I'll come here to kind of shut my girl up and, you know, not to listen to a, you know, someone reading poems. But everybody in Hansworth the next day was talking about how this one man held the blues together um, after the music had stopped, because usually people would just go home or move on to another area. Where, um, and how did it feel? Did you know in that moment, did you, you know, was it kind of a turning point? Did you think, hey... I could make a living doing this or I could do more of this and really enjoy myself. At first I performed just for Rastafarians and I, I can remember a time when I started performing for black people who were not Rastafarians and I can remember a time when people said to me, hey, you know, your message is, is for everybody, go and perform, you know, for white people as well. And you were a Rastafarian by that stage. Yes, yes. And, and what does that mean beyond all the things we know, you know, the dreadlocks and so on? Well, I mean, if you could imagine being in a non-Christian country and someone saying to you, you know, please tell us about Christianity very quickly, it's very, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, there's three things that I think all Rastafarians have in common. Um, one is that they recognise Haile Selassie and his lineage is that lineage of David and Solomon, an unbroken lineage. Um, two, that they recognise um, Ethiopia or Africa as their spiritual homeland. And three, that they recognise a person called Marcus Garvey as a kind of prophet, as a kind of modern-day John the Baptist. Um, Marcus Garvey was um, the founder of the Pan-African movement. And um, quite an amazing person. I mean, when you think of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, two kind of black freedom fighters who came from completely different perspectives, but they both call themselves Garveyites because Garvey taught self-pride, black pride. We should have your next record. Uh, my, my next record is Marcus Garvey, um, the singer Burning Spear, who is one person, actually, proper name is Winston Rodney. Um, it's like dedicated his whole musical career to promoting the name of Marcus Garvey. And this is one of his most well-known kind of Rastafarian anthem, really. Come, little one, or let me do what I can for you. And you, and you. Marcus Garvey, performed by Burning Spear. So, Benjamin, you went to London when you were 22. It was 1980. Your first book of poems was published. You were taken up, as it were, by the, by the demo scene. What were the big issues for you then? I suppose Mrs Thatcher had just come to power. Yeah. What, what were the issues that you were demonstrating about and writing about? Um, obviously, racism. Um, but more importantly, I think, the, um, the National Front... Um, those were the days when we, on me on many occasions, I remember walking down the street in the middle of the night and just meeting a group of skinners and having to run for your life. Tell me about Nelson Mandela. He, he got to know about your work when he was still in prison on Robben Island, but you've since become friends. Well, what happened was that somebody gave him a parcel of my work, some of my books and poetry and tapes and things like this, um, the reason was because I'd done a fundraising tour around Europe to pay for a radio transmitter that the apartheid regime had smashed that belonged to South Africa in, in Tanzania. So he read it and listened to it. I'm told that he passed it around his little government that was in prison. So the next time he came to England, he was actually coming to meet Mrs Thatcher. And... Um, he contacted me and said that he wanted to meet me. And I'll, I'll never forget it, because it was like 7 o'clock in the morning. 
And I said, that's ridiculous, can't you meet me after seeing Mrs Fatty? And he said, no, I, I need you to brief me. <laughs> yeah, I met him, um, that was my first meeting with him. Now he greets you like a long-lost friend. So. Now we're all mates, yeah, we hang out together all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. <laughs> Record number five. Record number five is um, We Can't Believe It by Michael Smith. Michael Smith, a very important Jamaican poet who unfortunately was stoned to death for his political beliefs in Jamaica. I think it was around about 1984. But um, this poem is probably one of his most well-known poems, a very kind of Jamaican poem, but what he's trying to do here is describe the kind of poverty and the things that he sees in everyday life in Jamaica, and he's just saying that he cannot believe what he's seeing, but he sees it every day. I say I can't believe it. I say I can't believe it. Room them a rent, me apply within. But as me going cockroach, rat and scorpion also come in. One good nose of a run. But me now go to sit down for a high wall like Humpy Dumpy. Me, I face my reality. One little boy come blow him on. And me look on him with scan. As me realize, some of five boy picnic was a victim of the trick them called partisan politics and my ban my belly and my ball. And my ban my belly and my ball. Lord, me can't believe it. Me say, me can't believe it. My daughter boyfriend name is Sailor. And him passed through the port like a ship. More grand picnic for feed and the whole we need. What a night, what a plight, and we can't get a bite. My life is a stiff fight and we can't believe it. Part of the poem, Me Can't Believe It, by Michael Smith. It, it's, it's a wonderful rhythm. I love it? the way you said that, Dennis. Have you practised? <laughs> yeah, you know, you're right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you, you do a lot with children. You've written um, books for children of poetry as well. You like doing that, don't you? Workshops with children. It's nice and fresh and real. Yeah, I, 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 I hate that term, workshops. I remember Alexis Sale saying to me once that uh, workshops are places where people go and make things. <laughs> My so-called workshops are, are performances where I allow the children to talk to me and question me about poetry and I try and inspire them to go away and write poetry. I never want to become like a teacher, not that I'm against teachers, but I don't want to be like a teacher where I say, right, now, boys and girls, sit down and we've we got half an hour we're going to write a poem. I want to inspire them to write poetry and then let the teachers do the work afterwards. You've written a poem about not having any children of your own. That's right, yes. Do you, can you tell me about that and perhaps read me the poem? Well, it was... Um, I always suspected that I, were, I wasn't able to have children. And after being married for a few years, I went to my doctor and told her that um, what I thought, and she just didn't believe me, you know. I remember she grabbed my muscles and went, you're a strong boy, you know. So I did all the tests and then I wrote an article in The Observer about it and it really struck a chord because it's an issue uh, within men generally, but um, black men tend to see, you know, being able to have children as something to do with strength and virility and, and, and things like this. But this is a poem that... Um, I try to look at myself, and it's called Childless. Strong biceps, firm thighs, big bottom, sexy eyes, fast on the track, strong like a lion, good kung fu feet and healthy hair. Strong triceps, no lie, rhymester, nice guy, a good healthy back, great levels of iron, there must be a baby in there somewhere. There must be a baby in here. And how much does it depress you that there isn't? Um, a lot. You know, it's, it's little moments, and there was a moment um, not too long ago where I was just watching people playing with their children. For some reason, it just struck me then. I really just felt like crying. And I've always wanted these very simple things in life, and one of them has just been a, a baby, and it's like the one thing that I can't have no control over, really. I can't order it. I can't ring a friend and get him to organise it or something like this. And it's very difficult for me to talk about it, and that's, that's why I write poems, because I kind of express myself easier through poetry. I'm going to start getting tearful now. Can we talk about football or something? Let's talk about music. <laughs> Tell me about this one. What is it? It's number six. Number six is Churalia. It's, um, it's produced by Bally Segu. 
Uh, it's a great record, and the reason why I've chose it because it just says a lot about the time we're in now, the multicultural nature of Britain. Here is Britain, British-born Asian producer using reggae as his kind of bottom line, bringing in kind of Indian melodies, um, Hindi singing with um, a white man doing Jamaican-style rap toasting. And I think it's just, you know, just kind of <laughs> it's really symbolic of the melting pot that we're in. Churalia, produced by Bally Segu. Um, Benjamin Zephaniah, in 1986, I think it was, you were offered the post of artist in residence at Trinity College, Cambridge, and then it was withdrawn. What, yeah. what happened? What went wrong? Well, I mean, I'll never know the whole truth, but um, I know a lot more than, than most people know. But really what happened was, I think, that the people at Cambridge backed down because there was just so much... Um, media interest because of me getting this post. I mean, all the press went crazy about it, and and all they were concerned about was the fact that you know I was black, you know, and I was a Rastafarian, and that I'd been in trouble with the police. They chickened out. Is they, what you're they, saying. they chickened out, yeah. Because I mean, after all, to an extent, some of these posts are meant to generate publicity, aren't they? You're supposed to add colour to the university, and. I probably added a bit too much colour, you know. I mean, some of the comments that people said were, were quite hurtful, but actually it shows a lot about the kind of people that we're dealing with. I mean, the two that stand out most of all is one person who said that um, Benjamin Zephaniah has done a lot for performance poetry in this country. You know, he needs to be recognised, but, you know, we should be able to recognise him when he's dead, you know, in the great British tradition. <laughs> and somebody else said a similar thing... We enjoy it, because I used to go to Cambridge all the time and do poetry readings in the university. And somebody else said, um, you know, we really enjoy Benjamin Zephaniah when he comes in, he reads his poetry and he talks to us, but we want him to go home at night. <laughs> and then in 1989, you were nominated for the post of uh, Oxford Professor of Poetry. And that was the year that Seamus Heaney got it, of yeah. course. So, so the competition was tough. How much did you want that post? How much would you really have liked it? Well... I'd have actually liked both both posts. I think the thing with the Oxford one was it was a little bit more democratic in the sense that people voted for it. And I think it was sad that we were... I was pitched up against Seamus Heaney, who was a writer I really do admire and really do love. And quite a performance and poet And quite himself, a performance poet himself, yeah. Do you think it might happen yet that you might get one of these kinds of posts? No, I think my time's over now. Do you? Um, you know, I, I mean, I would much rather it go to one of the younger performance dub poets um, rather than myself. Next record. Next record is Take Five. I just love it. I, you know, I just love it. And when I'm um, auditioning saxophone players in my band, you know, I say, play that. <laughs> if you can't play that, I won't even talk to you, you know. It's, it's, it's the starting point. So here's something I'm just doing for the fun of it. Dave Brubeck's Take Five, with Dave Brubeck on piano, Paul Desmond on alto sax, Gene Wright on bass and Joe Morello on drums. You're obviously very comfortably off these days, Benjamin. <laughs> and you don't drink and you don't smoke and you're a vegan. So you'd be fine on a desert island. I mean, I'd be yeah, completely ball, happy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Writing poetry in your yeah. head. I wouldn't even need a gym, really, because I'd have things to exercise with. I need an audience. <laughs> That's how I would miss an audience, I mean... Uh, I think I'd have to get the animals to sit down so I could perform to them. Because <laughs> um, I would need to preach to somebody. 
but would you would you be able to stay happy if you could do all of that, or or might you just sort of spiral downwards to somewhere not very nice? No, I think I think because of my ability to meditate, I'd be able to stay on top of it. Last record. My last record is um, Klu Klux Klan by Steel Pulse. Steel Pulse, I think, uh, one of the greatest reggae bands in the world. They're from Handsworth in Birmingham, like myself. But more importantly, they're British, and um, most people think of reggae as a kind of Jamaican thing. Um, but, like I said, Steel Pulse are recognised around the world. But this track, Klu Klux Klan, I remember it because it, it, it takes me back to them days in the 70s, although we didn't actually have the Klu Klux Klan here, we had the National Front and we still have the BNP. Um, and it was one of the tunes that was in my life when I really became kind of a political animal. And it, it talks about walking down the road and just being confronted by racists and having to run for their lives. One nigger, the less, the better, the sure. Stand strong, black skin, and take your blow. I says that the Ku Klux Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, here to stop our black man, yeah. I says that the Ku Klux Klan, yeah. Ku Klux Klan, played by Steel Pulse from the album Handsworth Revolution. Now, Benjamin, if you could only take one of those eight records, which one would you take? I think I would have to take... I think I'd have to take Take Five. <laughs> Forget the word, just have something to just drift off. It's a really desert islandy kind of song. What about your book? Um, my book, well, at home I have... Um, a uh, book published in 1853 by Edward Moxon, and it's The Poetical Works of Percy Bysshe Shelley. And I've, I've always loved Shelley. I don't claim to kind of fully understand him, but um, the poet I really, really love. So I'd, I'd take that. And your luxury? My luxury? Well, I think I'd need some drama on the island, and, um, you know, you'd ha you, so you need some tension. So I'd like... My luxury would be, um, you know, if somebody could make me a set of the law, put it up in a plaque somewhere where I can see the law every day. So, But I the could, rules of the island? The rules of the island, the law of the land, so I could break it at least once a day. Because I, I believe that it's quite healthy to break the law at least once a day, <laughs> especially when you're hurting nobody, you know? Benjamin Zephaniah, thank you very much indeed for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. My pleasure. You've been listening to a podcast from the Desert Island Discs archive. For more podcasts, please visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4.